Welcome to the Recruiter Startup Podcast. My name is Dolta Daherde, and in this podcast series, I will be interviewing investors, advisors, founders, thought leaders, and recruiters who are based all over the world in how to set up, scale, and operate a world-class recruitment company. Today, I'm bringing you to LA. We're going to speak to the founder of IntelliTech, a UK niche boutique recruitment agency, and we're speaking to Jason Romney. He has been in the industry for about eight years and set up his business in London and eventually managed to get it out to LA. Has a small enough operation that does exceptionally well and has a bit of a point of difference in how active they are within the communities that they recruit and has a bit of a different model than a lot of the traditional UK recruitment companies. And it's working for them in terms of the people they're able to attract and the results that they're getting and how lean their business model is. Um, His life sounds pretty awesome. I'm jealous of his business. I've learned quite a bit from interviewing him. And if you're thinking of setting up a tech recruitment business, I uh, I think this is one that you'd want to listen to. And yeah, I'll leave it. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Enjoy. Let me know what you think. Over to Jason. Jason Romney, how are you today? Hey. Very, very well. How are you? Yeah, I'm not bad at all. Tell me this. Where in the world are you right now? Uh, currently, I am in my new office in Los Angeles. Tomorrow, I will be in Las Vegas. Business um, or pleasure? At Black Cat. Uh, pleasure. Well, a mixture of both, but primarily um, pleasure. But I've got Black Cat for a couple of days. Then, in terms of my travels after that, on the 20th, if I go back to London. Then I'm in Spain. Then I'm in Ibiza, then I'm in uh, London for a bit, and then I take the guys to Thailand for a work trip, and then back to London, back to Spain. It's all in within like eight weeks, and then back to Los Angeles. Lovely, lovely, nice lovely. No, there's a big difference between somebody who has a lifestyle business and somebody who builds out a business. But I think when I look, when I think of your life and I think of mine, I think maybe it's uh, I think maybe it's worthwhile building it out so you can go do all that. But tell us where it all began. How'd you get into recruitment? You're 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 still you're still a young guy, aren't you? Uh, thirty one in April. Well, I was I was thirty one in April. So brief overview of my recru- recruitment career, which is coming up to ten years now. So I worked for a couple of companies in London, a company called IT Talent, straight from university. How I fell into recruitment, I essentially was doing a business course for four years, did a placement year, uh, ended up working for SAP directly, uh, was working on some of their new business sales, uh, found that I quite liked it and wanted to earn a shit ton of money and ended up um, going into recruitment that way. So I worked for IT Talent for a couple of Did you of make years. a shit ton of money then, with IT Talent? Uh, I, did, I did very well with them. They were small and trying to grow. Um, the struggle they had was they didn't invest in senior people. So after a while, it wasn't right for me. During that time, I actually lost my oh. father, who had a uh, who ended up having brain cancer and uh, died within three months. So that was um, a massive blow. I actually got offered to move out to set up the LA office with console partners, but turned it down uh, because of the death oh, of my God. father. Um, so that was one of the reasons that spurred me on to start up. But then I moved to a company called City Tech. We were primarily IT into finance and I set up their digital arm. Um, so they brought me in and, and set up a digital team and grew it uh, within 18 months. But I didn't want to work for someone else. And one of the biggest um, selling points for me was my, my father always said he was a quantity surveyor. And one of the biggest things that uh, I'll always remember is he said to me, uh, he wished he set up his business um, earlier than he did. I think he did it in his when he was 35, 40. And 
I was like, okay, now's the right time to do it. So, uh, so let me jump. Let me jump I into left. some of that. So, sure. you're, you are you mainly doing development? Are you mainly doing new technology? Correct. When I was working for IT Talent and City Tech, it was mainly engineering development across London and Europe. Okay, great. And when you were at City Tech, what at what stage? Mm-hmm. Like, what was that day like when you came in and thought, "Now is the time to do it." for myself how did that culminate well sure so i think they were primarily and i and still are primarily uh, it into finance and provided for a lot of the banks now when i came to them and set up the digital team i all of the all of the referrals were through me i was doing um like the dublin web summit and conferences and everyone like all of my connections were, were via me it wasn't any of the current kind of company because it was a slightly different area and I was like, well, why am I building it out for someone else when I should be doing it for mm. myself? And did you find you won a lot of businesses by going to conferences and getting involved in that? How did, how did you manage to make that happen as part of your job? It seems like a lot of recruitment companies can be quite stringent in how, you, how they operate. How did, that, how did that come about? Sure. Um, so I think, yeah, back in the day, the conferences were, were good. I think now... Certainly the ones in Europe that I've, I've, I've been to, I haven't been to some of them for a while. Um, I know that they're full of recruiters. And I think just generally I'm a people person, young guy who's smart and switched on. And uh, I think look, there's a lot of people that go to a lot of these free events that good people just don't have the time to do that mm. anymore. Um, and I think it was, yeah, after a while I saw the potential in doing that, but mixing it with, with how I was taught. I had a great like training at my first company, IT Talent, and the, the boss was XS3. Um, and I think that kind of dr- drove me on to to kind of bigger and better things. But I, I didn't like the way that some of that business was run. And, what type of things? Uh, that they didn't go to conferences. Just in terms of not spending money on senior people or they always wanted to train juniors. The S3 model. Um, and that, yeah, exactly, the S3 model. And I think for some people it works, but I've found... And, with some of the first people that I hired out in in the US, like I think that model, it's tough to kind of replicate. Um, and if you're building a business, and we all know how quickly the market changes, um, you need to have experience and bring it in. Yeah, yeah. sure, that IP is real important. So mm-hmm. you're you're in your twenties, your mid twenties, right? When you're when you're about to set up this. I was twenty six. Yeah, I think yeah, twenty six. I've had it for five years. I'm thirty one. Yeah, so twenty six. You're twenty six. Are you, you're living in mm-hmm. London? Yeah. So I was living in Essex with my mum. With your mum. Um, <laughs> it was obviously, yeah, yeah it was obviously yeah. a hard time for us. I was, uh, and I did move out and then kind of came back. But essentially, yeah, I moved back in and I was working from home a bit, but I'm a, a big, big believer in um, like mirroring off your clients. A lot of my clients were small startups. So I started working out of um, these tech spaces. So I, So, yeah, going backwards, I was um, working out of a co-working space in Shoreditch. And were you able to, were you able to like, I had a guest on the other, the other day, Ken Harborn, and he said, uh, he said he was uh, hanging around the coffee machine. Every time he'd hear the coffee machine go, he'd go up and see who was there so we could get to speak to somebody. I'm sure it was different for you, but w- mm. was it a good place for networking and meeting maybe with, with technical people or for startups? Yeah, so I, I didn't have that approach personally because a lot of certainly when I was in the Google campus, I was like the first recruiter that was based out of them. And, and my approach, yeah, I wouldn't go up to people like I tell people if they asked about what I was doing. But I think recruiters obviously have a stigma about themselves and still continue to do so. So as much as I was networking and stuff, I was I was so busy with clients. And uh, yes, I'd speak to people, but I do it subtly and and. Mm because now there's more and more i see more and more recruiters being based out of WeWorks and uh, and other places and it's not the, for some recruitment companies it's not the best environment uh, for that approach because um yeah for the reasons i mentioned earlier yeah yeah i think it, it's uh, the industry definitely the uk centric industry anyway can be a bit overly salesy at times instead mm-hmm. of being consultative um 
and usually that's the biggest difference between some of the better businesses and maybe some of the ones that are just massive and putting in old McDonald's work processes. <laughs> so, so you're in that you're you're in the off you're in the co-working. And yes. You making a bit of money from day one? Are you you having any worries about that? Or like... Yeah, I think I took out a ten grand loan when I first started, and that's the only money that I've I've taken out. I don't don't own any loans, and I yeah had yeah haven't had. I think I was keeping it lean and small, and uh, um, yeah, I mean that was my approach from day one. And until I got a certain amount in the bank, would I then look to hire people? Um, and uh, so tell me. What was that amount that you felt comfortable to make the first hire under? Probably, like about, 50, probably about 50 grand. And, and, and so that was, that was set aside. And then you had obviously a pipeline sure. of stuff where you're like, okay, I can pay mom a bit of rent. And, I know. I was, yeah, I was kind of helping her out. Uh, yeah. Yeah. As you can imagine. And, and so how did that process go? You're, you're there. You're doing a niche recruitment. Mm -hmm. You've got a vision for something that that's more than where you're at. You're at at that moment. How did you bring people on? Who did you bring on? What was that process like in convincing somebody that this is the right opportunity to join you? Sure. I think the, the first person I tried to take on was an admin person, which I think was the wrong thing to do um, because I needed help kind of trying to scale. Um, I then went to a couple of people that I used to work with. Uh, naturally that's where you gravitate to um but uh, yeah i kind of just felt that obviously i was new my first uh, business i set up and i i, I felt myself that i was pushing on a lot more than others naturally um so in, in what manner tough, just in terms of uh how to find time to manage people as well as um i was working all the hours under the sun as you can imagine for my business uh, and others, you kind of felt sometimes nine to five, and then they were out the door and didn't really kind of have too much of a care in the world. So, um, yeah, a learning curve for me was, okay, um, spend more time. And, and I was inexperienced in, in terms of interviewing and trying to get people on board. I think mm. people knew the vision, but a lot of people probably felt, yeah, it's another startup that's just going to be in, in London doing engineering. And, and that's all I really kind of looked to do. From the, from the from the word go but obviously things change and and so so when you're did you initially just take on one person or did you take on two at the same time uh, i took a couple of people on board yeah i think there was three it's going back so long now but i think it was uh, i took one admin person and then one um recruiter who i'd previously worked with mm. and ob ob obviously you know a lot more now given mm -hmm. given the the, the the five plus years that that you've been running this business did did you reach out to any anybody for any advisory help when you were doing this, or you, were you running so lean that you were like, I just need to get a couple of people on and then I'll structure things afterwards? Like, what was your approach? Sure. So yeah, one of the one of my biggest regrets and and uh, was probably not setting up with someone. So I had my closest friend, a guy called Gary Tiller, who uh, later joined the company because I, I, I it became too much when I was over in the US and trying to manage both offices. Um, so he. He's very good at operations and finance and, and the back office stuff. Uh, so he helped me along the way um, in terms of like operationally, because I didn't have a clue in terms of what I was doing. And I think sure. I was just trying to kind of almost wing it. But for me, it was important the sales stuff. Um, the Yeah, I, I, I didn't have a website for at least a year. I didn't need all of that stuff. I had clients coming back to me and... Um, yeah, just the, the the approach that I used was similar to the same um, method that I still use today in terms of specking out great candidates. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like part and parcel, that's how I've grown my business and probably will do for the remainder of, of the time that I, I'm i recruiting. So so, so you're, you're at the tip of the spear, winning business, networking, getting out there mm -hmm. and Gary sweeping up behind you and putting in some processes to make sure that things things grow and, and you have a proper process in place moving forward yeah and um, what was what was the next stage of of your business because you must have was, was you, there must have been a point when you, you, have you got these guys the, the first couple of hires profitable yeah like what what was that process like um yeah so i think it came a point and uh 
this was back in 2013. So I always was looking at different markets to kind of go into. Yeah. And um, I was doing a lot of fintech stuff and I heard about blockchain and, and Bitcoin and uh, kind of fascinated me. So I started doing more research about it. And I saw that all these companies were raising funding and I was uh, thinking, OK, well, the logical step is they're going to need to hire people. Mm-hmm. So I I was exploring a bit more there and went to a lot of talks in, in London and Europe back in early 2013. Um, and I then decided to, OK, give it a go and start specking into blockchain companies um, globally uh, because I saw a really niche gap that I thought I could kind of leverage off of and, and, and kind of create. So that kind of worked. And, I, and over the space of kind of six months, I, I was in San Francisco. I was doing a talk in San Francisco at one of the tech clubs out there. I was like, hold on a minute. There's no recruiters in this space. I'm going to focus my time and effort in that. Not exclusively, but probably about 60 to 80% of my time was spent um, looking at that market. So I had some people that were focused on cybersecurity in the company, some people doing core engineering. And then I was doing the blockchain um, kind of work. And that's a yeah, lot of different worlds to manage. It, it is. But I think in terms of um, one thing I'm a firm believer of is um, having the tools and technologies in order to do our job. Machine learning AI is obviously really important for uh, the way that this world moves right now. And uh, I had the tools available to, to be able to do that. I used to, when I first started in recruitment, I used to always be taught just going to one specific market. And I think although you can find some exceptional recruiters within that space, I've been able to build a business without, with looking into certain areas and not, may, not maybe just specializing those one or two areas. And that's how we've, op- we've, we've been able to open lots of different divisions up. Mm. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. It, when you do different divisions, it's harder to move a market. Sure. Uh, that, that's the only thing I would, I would say from, from what I've learned. Um, so, so that's so that's really interesting, and and what was what was the next piece of the business for you? At what stage did you did you think, okay, do you know what? I'm flying out a lot to America. Maybe I should maybe I should open up an office there. And and, and how many heads did you have in London at this stage? Sure. So it was all still really lean. It was probably about five heads in London. Um. So I, I always wanted to go to america i just got married um to my wife and um she was open to the idea we looked at san francisco which is where a lot of the uh companies are kind of primarily based but we both loved la just down to the weather the culture the environment and i thought okay if if i could kind of set up a company here and just go out to san francisco that was probably gonna be the best bet because my wife would be happy i would be happy and would be able to live here so it probably took me about 18 months to two years to, to kind of plan it i was often doing uh, london time and then switching over two or three nights a week to sf time um, because... and is this when was gary managing the uk N- presence no right? so no so gary came into the business after my first year out here okay um yeah i'll probably come on to that bit later okay yeah no props um so so are you running both offices correct yeah when i first started i was managing um or trying to manage both offices and uh, for for a while it, it it worked but i had quite junior people in my london office and they needed a lot more structure and i was up early i was often up at like 4 a.m uh, la time um but they saw the potential um in terms of the business that was out here and i'd done maybe like between five and eight deals and they, the, the value of the deals out here obviously is a lot higher. So they knew that it, it had potential, but I, I, I didn't have the right structure and training to be able to manage both offices. And it was like, I need a partner ASAP. And the guy, uh, Gary, who doesn't come from recruitment, but that's to his benefit and to my benefit is because, so he comes from an operations background. He was a CEO of a, a company and, and, he he was set to make just over a million in, in uh, his last company was was about to sell post Brexit, um, but the decision was with the Brexit result was yeah he lost out and he he just wanted out of of, of that company so um, he joined he's my best friend we grew up together and as an amazing kind of different element to kind of recruiting because he's more operation analytics statistics legals and stuff that i'm terrible at he's great perfect so he's able to he's able to look at the workflow 
of your yeah. recruiters, what they're up to, maybe where the holes are at, and then identify solutions moving forward. Exactly. Excellent. And and that gives you time to be out there winning business and mm-hmm. maybe maybe leading the troops a little bit and lead by example. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. So what was that process like from uh, did, like getting a like moving to moving to LA? You, you obviously had to. Did you did you get a an E two visa for yourself first or? And how, how did that process work? <laughs> Don't get me started. So I think it took me about 18 months to get the E2. It was, it was down to me because obviously you have to invest in a company. And yeah. um, I, I actually came out here and brought over a guy I used to work with at City Tech. He's excess free. Um, so he came out here as a director. Um, he was but he was living in Chicago and then he was having a baby and they moved out to L.A. because she was from L.A. If that makes us, if that makes yep. sense. So we worked together for a year, and and it was me, him, and another guy in in the office out here from pretty much day one. Um, but I, after a year, I ended that. This was prior to Gary um, joining, um, but I, I ended it because I just felt that I was I wasn't gaining much from him, and he was gaining more for himself. Um, and it was supposed to be a partnership, and it wasn't. Um, but you live and you learn, like great mm-hmm. guy. Um, I think he's set up by himself out here as well, um, oh, very got, good. And, and and got people working. So, yeah, kudos to him. Um, walk, walk walk me through what what it's like in LA because I, I'm hearing a lot about you know the last boom was Silicon Valley, and I'm mm-hmm. hearing a bit about Silicon Alley. Can you can you walk us through that? Yeah, so we actually we're based in LA, but we I can't remember the last deal we've done in LA, probably about a year ago. So, really? yeah. So as much as we're based here, it's purely down to the weather. And I've started to bring over a couple of recruiters from London. It's an easier city to live in. Like it's probably about 35 degrees here today, um, which it is most days at the moment. And like San Francisco is like miserable and, and it's raining. So I, I knew that if, if there was an environment where I could kind of bring over some UK recruiters, here was going to be the place. But yeah, I, because of the tools and technology that we're using, we we don't need to be based in the same location. And I know quite a lot of other recruiters that um, are also based in LA, but do a lot of work in um, San Francisco. Yeah, I think the American model is is quite is quite uh, fluid like that. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people don't meet their candidates and try and do the Skype thing and maybe they might fly in and do some some candidates or some client stuff but it's not necessary as much as say it would be in well for Australia if you tried to do that in Australia you'd be you'd be closed down within four months <laughs> yeah I've hired a guy from Australia and we're going through the visa process with another guy right now so yeah I I uh, yeah completely understand but I think as well we don't really meet candidates we don't really need to but no. we're placing people at between 150 to 250 k at twenty five percent, and these companies are uh, they 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 need like ten fifteen people in the next like two months. Uh, they've got so much money; it's crazy, um, and the fees are huge out here. So that's the reason why we do it in in LA. There's a bit more uh, internal recruiters and more uh, external recruiters rather than San Francisco. What we mostly compete up against is internal recruiters. Interesting, mm-hmm. and is that is that it, yeah? Because it, it, they're they're really strong in American internal recruitment, and uh, are they? Well, I mean, they're militant. If you try and work with them, how how have you found them? Um, I think that the reason why a lot of British companies do well out here is because the internal recruitment process is is quite flawed in most companies. There's too many people trying to do the job that one recruiter can do. They have people to schedule interviews and corporate recruiter and technical recruiter. Um, for me, it's it's been a godsend in, in terms of who we're competing against. Often we work roles that have been struggling internally and have a team of like 10 to 12 internal recruiters working on it for eight months. And then we come in and work the role and within three or four weeks we've, we've hired someone and all we've done is advertised on our, our website and on LinkedIn. And I'm just like, well, how comes you guys haven't haven't been able to find someone? Yeah, it's, it's been mind boggling. How, how have you managed to win so much business? How, it, like, are you going there and meeting them, or is there? Like... Yeah. So the model that I usually adopt is we're based here most of the time in LA. Um, we 
we're essentially resourcing. We do pick up clients um, and we're getting quite a few referrals. Um, but usually we go out to San Francisco for two or three days. We'll do between six to eight meetings in a day. Um, and we, if we do, yeah, if we're covering that, say there's four of us that go out for that amount of time. Yeah, clients, one thing that's that's been amazing is um, that people value time more here. You don't need to um, take people out for dinners and big lunches and our expenses in terms of f- from that angle rather than in London where you'd have to wine and dine internal oh. food just to get on the PSL. It's when I was in, when I was with Walters in in, uh, in Australia, the, the senior management team, I, I think they, they obviously got paid their salary, they got paid their bonuses and then they, uh, and then they got their expenses. I think that's how it was looked at. It, the, the whining and dining is out of control. Yeah. I, uh, I think I just prefer the way that, that it works in America. And one of the things I like about your, your business, and you mentioned it earlier, is that you say you try and mirror your clients. Can, can you kind of go into that a little bit? Uh, I think just being as direct and, and, and upfront and if you want to work with us or you want to work up against us. And uh, I think too many people sometimes pussyfoot around that kind of topic. Um, we know that we're... We're, we're growing and clients can see that in terms of some of the awards that we've won and the types of people that we've hired and the types of markets that we're going into so uh, i mean i for example I, i've just started advising for blockchain companies and people want to work with us because they know i'm one of the first recruiters in that space and have been been constantly on people's backs about blockchain since 2013 rather than um just find just being another recruiter that started to go into it over the last six and 12 months sure. um kind of thing so we've hired mobile we've hired well experts in their field i hired a 400k recruiter mobile recruiter um daniel hirsch who moved out from from the uk um and he's killing that market 400 um, decent in the uk yeah 400 is very good and then he went traveling so he was at gravitas and then went traveling and then um yeah like security and devops I brought over a guy, Kyle, who I think is going to be on the podcast, I think in September, he mentioned. Um, but yeah, he's come in and killed it. He's yeah, you pipped him off me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so me and him are off to Black Hat tomorrow and expensive event in Vegas. But like the, the connections we're going to make, I, I was there not last year, the year before. I was staggered that there was a, probably an event of 50,000 um, people all in, the, in the cyber sex space. And I, I don't think I spoke to one other recruiter. So uh, tell, yes. He, I, go yeah. So just a, how do we look in your website? You describe yourself as a boutique. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, I, and I quite like that because a lot of the other UK recruitment firms are very much S3 children where they're running very similar models. Um, so what, what does it mean to you to, to kind of maintain that boutique status and what type of stuff do you do with your recruiters so maybe the environment's a little bit different working sure. for you than say say s3 for example or, or or one of the major corporations yeah so i think um for ex- well one thing for example we don't even have a marketing marketing department um and we've got over 25 26 000 followers so we had marketing people but then I don't need an Instagram page. You can see most of the stuff on LinkedIn, which is where most recruitment companies kind of go to or our competitors go to. Mm-hmm. Um, so I keep, keep keeping it lean and spending more of the profits on our staff. Um, so we had an incentive, a six-month incentive that um, has just uh, finished up to go to Thailand. I think about 80% of us are going. Um, we're going to go out for a week in October. Um, and we have other, like kicker incentives so we had an incentive where people could go business class if they hit above i think like 40 percent above their their target and eight of us are going business class to to thailand for a week um but also doing other events like we go and watch baseball out here we go uh, a lot for dinners and i think it's it's found it's taken me time to find the right kind of environment and the right recruiters but i think yeah, just not doing your like we we do lunch clubs. We go to Nobu Malibu, which is probably one of my favourite restaurants in the world. Um, but it's just more people can see the potential, um, and we're very we are very lean. Um, yeah. But we're for yeah for a company of our size, uh, we're we're doing very very high billing and <laughs> um, yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. So, so I, I get the culture piece and, and the rewarding bit. Mm -hmm. what, what does it mean for somebody who comes in and is working there? It's Monday morning. What, what, what does that look like in a boutique? How, how, do, you, how do you guys ma manage performance and get the best out of people? Is there a certain process that you have in place? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so, so number one, I'm still very hands-on. So I still love winning clients, winning um, candidates. So I still do what I, I always did as well as run the business. And that really helps because I'm very, I am process driven, but I think Monday morning we're inundated with clients at the moment and um, people know how much they can earn. People are doing over hundred K months here. Uh, I think it kind of, I did, I think a year and a half ago, I did a month, uh, I did 280 K in a month and it was like five deals. And I was like, wow, wow. I'm, only, I, I'm only half recruiting here. I'm not, not the best recruiter, and, but the, the, the fees out here that people pay are huge uh, because, yeah, like it's, it's crazy, but it can be done. And, and I think that too many people um, probably go down the route of just following what their boss say and, and they don't really look outside of that kind of model. Um, but, yeah, that's kind of – I know I'm kind of – going backwards probably on a question that you answered earlier, but... <laughs> that's okay i haven't had my coffee this morning that's all right i've had five uh, <laughs> um, okay so loads of money to be made and um, you lead by, so you, i suppose the question was kind of just more about the environment in terms of in terms of like how do you manage them is there kpis that you put in place is there yeah yeah obviously like, I, I look at kind of resumes out I know it's weird I say resumes now rather than CVs. Um, yeah, so I look at resumes out and, and interviews really and, and it's very like the business that we're in is very much email focused rather than phone focused. We have a couple of guys that focus on sales and they do um, like SDRs, BDRs. Oh, those lads love chat. Exec, salesman. Yeah, exactly. So they'll speak a bit more but these engineers from Uber, Facebook, Google, uh, Twilio, for example, they don't want to speak yeah. to us. Um, but if, if they come back on an email and they're potentially interested, we, we even have to send the company names and then they're like, okay, I'm interested in these. I would never do that back in the day, but you have to mirror your candidates and mirror the market. If you don't, if, if you just want to speak to everyone, um, then you're going to get yeah. out and someone else is going to gain from it. So as much as it's hard and you do lose, you may lose a couple of candidates from from that approach, you have to do it out here. Otherwise, you're just, yeah, you're not going to succeed. Yeah. Oh, that's, uh, that's fascinating. Um, if somebody hits target with you, what can they make a year? Um, well, Carl at the moment is top villa. He, this is his first full year um, with us. He'll probably do between five and 600K. Um, my, my biggest year, um, I've done 850 and 1.2 million in a year. Um, what what will Carol and bring home? I've, Ballpark. I don't know. Uh, probably between two to two fifty. Two fifty. And I'm struggling to persuade people from Manchester to go to LA. It's, it's, uh... Yeah, I I mean I'm actually going to be in London. One of the biggest things that I'm going to be doing when I'm back. Um, so I'm there all of most of September, and uh, quite a bit of October is meeting it senior recruiters so myself and gary both decided that if we want to bring people like the visa stuff for us is, is fine we've got an amazing lawyer and we've we've taken two people we're just in the process of taking a third, third and fourth actually um and uh we're yeah if for any 200k plus um consultant i would consider bringing them out here um but they'd probably work in our london office that our london office mostly focuses now on uh the east coast uh, so, um, but they'd probably focus on in in London for like a couple of months, and then we'd bring them over to LA. Um, so I'm going to be doing a lot of breakfast and lunch meetings with people that are open to moving out here because I want to mix that UK and US talent together. And and I know it can can work. And and yeah, some of these US recruiters are great, uh, but naturally I kind of gravitate towards the UK recruiters because their training's better. They're more bought in and they can smell money more than a lot of people on the west coast that i've met well thank you so much for your time it's been uh, it's been great getting to getting to know how a proper boutique tech business works out there 
Pleasure. And uh, we'll be in touch soon. Um, and, and I take it to sure. everybody can reach out to you on LinkedIn. That's where you're at. Yeah, LinkedIn or Jason at Intellitech.com. And if you're open to meeting for a coffee or for a lunch to explore more, please let me know. Wonderful. Take care. Cool. Thanks very much, Delta. Well, a massive thank you to Jason for coming on the podcast. I am pretty jealous of his recruitment business. And I question being a wreck to wreck quite a lot. <laughs> I, uh, I did IT recruitment for about four years and I was all right at it. And we fell into the wreck to wreck stuff and it's gone well. And I have to be appreciative for it. But it's tough work. And it's a tough business to scale. And when... I hear about the fees that Jason and his team are making out in California. I, I do question what I'm doing with my career and my business. But, okay, it's, uh, it, is, it is what it is. And I have to be thankful for all that I have. But what a great business. And I like the way they fly into a location, do a ton of meetings, win a load of business, which doesn't seem to be hard to do. Um, do the events thing a little bit. It sounds like, you know, you get a good candidate, you, they'll get an interview. Interesting that you have to tell the candidate the, the companies before they'll even take the phone call. And from what I've heard from other people, it's a lot about controlling candidates and uh, instead of, instead of the, the client piece. So, yeah, really, really interesting business. I like the way that they've kind of maintained their boutique status. So he mentioned a few times of taking care of billers and what that means. And the fact that somebody could go out and make a quarter of a million, that's a pretty good option. And, you know, I had a statement on LinkedIn the other day and it blows my mind that people will sit in doing cold calls all day in the north of England and making 50, 60,000 British pounds when they could be out there making that. All you need is a couple of years experience, so a decent track record and potentially a degree. Not necessarily, but it helps. Anyway, enjoyed this one. Um, enjoyed getting to know Jason a bit, a bit better. Uh, we haven't done really any work with them ever. Um, in fact, as I, we alluded to, I, I missed out on a guy because he joined his team. That's how he really came across to me. Um, but yeah, great uh, great guest, great guy. And I uh, hope you've all enjoyed it. And, you know, keep, uh, keep giving the podcast five stars and the recommendations. Love it. It's great. And if you have any questions, like the guy who called me up today asking me, what should I do here and what should I do there? You know, I'll do my best to field them and or I can put you in touch with somebody who might be better equipped to help you out with a certain part of your recruitment business. But I'm always open to talking to anybody in our agency world. And yeah, I love it. So until, well, tomorrow we'll have another guest on, hopefully. So hope you're all enjoying the extra episodes. Um, there's so many interesting people in our industry that I have access to and hopefully it's shining a, a, a good light upon the personalities that, that are out there. Till next time. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.